All right. Hello, students, once again. Feel like I just saw you this morning, because I did. In fact, if you just watched the Chapter 19 video and you're binge watching, watching some US history for fun, um, you might note that I'm wearing the same sweatshirt I was wearing in Chapter 19. That's because Chapter 19 was just a couple hours ago. Yeah. Um, if you look through my YouTube channel, you'll see I dress quite remarkably the same during the, the um, uh, pandemic. Yeah, um, but if you look closely, they're generally different sweatshirts. I coached football for 18 years and various other sports around here, and one of the things you get is, is a bunch of cool blue sweatshirts, and it's the most comfortable uh, thing I own, so I, I just keep wearing them. So I do, like, bathe regularly and all, but that shouldn't really matter to you. Anyway, I mean, since we're doing this on video. Anyways, you don't want to talk about that. Hey, chapter 20. Look at that. It's the... Um, chapter 20 is the um, Progressive Era chapter, and it, it's an interesting time, right? Um, so the, in uh, the period between 1877 and 1900 is often called the Gilded Age. This was the time when, um, uh, when political power in the American government was not particularly strong. Um, we, the executive branch had ceded much of its power uh, after the, the problems of the Johnson administration. Congress had taken that power during, the, during Reconstruction, but then the political parties had agreed in 1877, in the Compromise of 1877, to really cede much of their power. And when, when the government said, we're going to be hands off, we're going to be laissez faire, then this led to corporations having a great deal of power. The real power brokers in the United States right before the turn of the 20th century were those robber barons, the Carnegies, the J.P. Morgans, the uh, John D. Rockefellers, folks like that, right? Um, and the government was hands off, laissez faire. Um, during the progressive era, we see a change in that. We see the, the government begin to take a more active role in, um, in solving some of the problems of the United States. The beginning of this, of this progressive era is uh, a little bit muddled. And one of the reasons the progressive era is kind of hard, it, it's harder to understand things sometimes <laughs> when it's hard to make a movie about. This is my theory. There are few main characters in the progressive era. If there is a main character, it's Theodore Roosevelt. But the progressive era is a whole bunch of reforms going on at different times. These people aren't calling each other. They don't have one set club. It's not just one political party. Both political parties have progressives and non-progressives, stuff like that. It's just kind of stuff happening around America. It's this, it's this era of reform. Kind of similar to the era we saw before the, the um, Civil War, the antebellum reform movements of the Second Great Awakening, right? Here, they're in a response to to urbanization and industrialization and immigration and certainly the the uh, the harshness of an of a nation very much driven by capitalism and greed right so a lot of people start to attack that from different ways um, if you ever go to a party full of history teachers um, uh, you might run into people arguing about whether the populist party, you remember that third party that was a party of farmers that was a couple chapters ago? Um, were the populists really progressives? Did that kick off the progressive era or were they totally separate movements? Stuff like that, right? Um, for whatever reason, people started to want to solve some of the problems that we saw in the United States. The first thing that's on my timeline there is a book. It's by uh, Jacob Reese. Um, and it's a book largely of photographs. It's called How the Other Half Lives. I guess I ought to stand this way so I can make sure that the camera can see that. How the Other Half Lives. Uh, we've seen, I've shown you pictures and not identified them, uh, from the book How the Other Half Lives. And this is Jacob Reese going around and, and documenting the, the poverty that a lot of workers are, that a lot of Americans are living in, particularly immigrants um, who work in factories in New York City. Um, the Lower East Side of New York City, right? And uh, if you remember a while ago in The Witch Came First, we saw a uh, 
whole bunch of people sleeping in this one little apartment in New York City, right? And Jacob Reese really documents kind of how a lot of people in America are living. This was, um, this was a way to poke some folks into action, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever had the sensation of, of you know, seeing a, seeing a YouTube video about poor kids in Botswana or something like that, and you get this kind of inkling like, now that I saw this video, I need to help. I can't imagine how, what those kids are going through. We need to change things, right? So Reese eventually was called a muckraker, and a lot of journalists of this era are called muckrakers because uh, Teddy Roosevelt names them muckrakers. And what he says they're doing is they're just going out and pointing out problems and publishing the fact that there are these problems, right? And when those newspapers and magazines had new technologies for publishing photographs and stuff, it became a lot easier to publish magazines in a way that you could get them out to people cheaper. So new print technologies really lead to a lot of this muckraking journalism also. But we see throughout a whole bunch of different uh, uh, media outlets, we see reporting on problems in American society, right? And this leads to calls to fix these problems, right? And so the journalists who create these stories are called muckrakers. Roosevelt didn't mean that as a, as a compliment, but eventually it does lead to action, right? This is, um, like I teach journalism also, right? And we often hear discussion of the mainstream media as having a liberal bias. And, um, you, you know, if you're watching this, you probably know I'm a pretty liberal dude, right? But I do think the mainstream media has a liberal bias. But it's not exactly the, I don't think it's as nefarious as it gets uh, portrayed, right? I think that what journalists quite frequently do is they go out and they, they cover things that are going wrong in society, right? So if I go out and I, and I uh, if Jacob Reese goes out and he, um, he shows the problems and the living conditions of working class Americans, there's part of, the, part of the readership is saying, somebody needs to do something about this. Who's the somebody? It's often the government. And so sometimes that journalism is seen as a call for bigger government, which is more in today's construction, more of a liberal thing. Right, um, And so journalism looks like it's constantly asking the government to do more and more, which today's Republican Party says, no, the government should be limited, right? So it seems like the, but I, I don't think that's intended as a liberal bias. I use the phrase liberal bias in the modern context. I don't think that liberal really works in this chapter too well. I think conservative does, but not liberal. The people who are calling for government action, the people who are looking for reform during this uh, chapter are called progressives, right? And it's not tied to a single political party. Um, there is a, a progressive party during this time and it gets some, uh, it wins some votes, right? Uh, but it's still a third party, and there are progressives in the Republican Party, there are progressives in the Democratic Party. So it really transcends that, that two-party divide. Part of the reason that it's outside of the political parties is because the vast majority of, Amer well, American women can't vote in federal elections throughout much of the progressive era. That's kind of at the end of the era. And much of the progressive movement is driven by women. Right. And so, uh, you know, they're not necessarily always attached to a single political party because they don't have as many political rights as other people. Right. Anyway, I got to get going here. Um, so as uh, I, I use the Jacob Reese book to kick this off, I'm not sure it's really a groundbreaking. It is kind of groundbreaking. It doesn't. It's not like, oh, that begins the progressive year. It's a little hazy where it begins. Um, the, as all this is going on, um, there's a push for women's, uh, for more rights for women and especially voting rights for women. What happened after the Civil War with voting rights for women wasn't so much that people gave up on the idea of, of voting rights for women. It was that um, the strategy by most women pushing for voting rights was not to get a constitutional amendment. What the, the groups who were um, what the groups who wanted women's voting rights to do was they wanted 
to, uh, as new states entered the Union in the West, we get a whole bunch of new states in the late 1800s. They have to write new constitutions. And so the idea is let's get women's voting rights on a whole bunch of those state constitutions out in the West. Um, in the West, women had traditionally had some more rights. I think this goes back to like frontier times when women were, were working in a more equal fashion next to men out on the ranch and those sorts of things. Uh, low levels of population meant uh, we were dependent on each other in, in ways that uh, transcended gender sometimes, you know? And so um, Western states were more likely to give women voting rights. Um, so uh, Wyoming, so this is a little hazy because I'm, I'm not sure, I, I just looked at this and it said Wyoming was the first state to give women voting rights in 1890, but I'm not sure that, that I've, I've read something different. A whole bunch of Western states give women voting rights. I'm not gonna tell you which one was first. You can Google it and get six different answers. I'm, I'm not sure Wyoming was a state in 1890, um, but the chart I saw had them in 1890 and Colorado in 1893 and I thought Colorado was first, I don't know. Anyway, um, so we see a progression of Western states giving voting rights to women. However, they still couldn't vote in federal elections, right? That doesn't happen until the 19th Amendment. Um, the Another place, like if you're looking for a main character in the Progressive Era movie, it's Theodore Roosevelt. Right. Theodore Roosevelt becomes president in 1901. He was the youngest president we ever had. I think he was 39 years old when he became president. Um, he was he became president when William McKinley was killed. So Roosevelt was his vice president. And Roosevelt, I don't I try not to teach U.S. history through a like it's like it's a whole bunch of of people's personalities, because most of this stuff is driven by bigger forces than individual personalities. Um, but Theodore Roosevelt, just by personality, could not be laissez-faire. Uh, he could not um, keep his hands off of stuff. When he heard of, he, Theodore Roosevelt was this amazing dude, um, smartest guy in the room, read like three books a day. He wrote like 50 books in his life, all these incredible things. We're going to spend a day in class on Theodore Roosevelt. But he, if somebody had a problem, he was like, I can fix that. I can fix anything. I'm the smartest guy you know. And I've got all, I've got the energy of a small village. And so um, Theodore Roosevelt, when he'd read an article from a muckraker, even if he didn't like the article, he's like, we got to do something to fix that. And this began a, a more proactive attitude in Washington, D.C. that I think, and so Roosevelt gives some of his, his can-do energy to the progressive movement, right? himself as a trust buster. And if you remember from chapter 18, um, trusts are basically monopolies, right? And so Roosevelt uh, wanted to take on the big monopolies that had so much control over American economic life and therefore just American life. And um, so he, is, he calls himself a trust buster, but what he's doing, he's not like saying all monopolies are bad. He thinks they're good trusts and bad trusts because really like a monopoly could be a good thing. Um, if, you know, if Ford was our only car maker and they made good cars and um, they did like sometimes being competitive costs money, right? So they wouldn't have to advertise and those sorts of things. They could probably, if they're being benevolent, they could create better cars for Americans at a lower price because comp if you got rid of the competitive elements to it, right? However, that never happens because if they've got the monopoly, they start charging higher prices. And But Roosevelt thought that sometimes monopolies could be a good thing. So. He, um, he tried to bust up the bad monopolies. Part of what he was doing was like making some backroom deals and stuff. Like he would, when a big business, when a, when a coal mine in 1908, uh, when the workers were about to go on strike because their bosses wouldn't give them a, a raise, um, Roosevelt called in the coal mine owner and called in the heads of the union and said, let's make a manly deal here. He was all about being manly, right? And, uh, and he would kind of work out a backroom deal that didn't always like work through legislation. It was very much on the force of Theodore Roosevelt's personality. Um, we do see, I, this isn't always a big deal, but 
there was this, the perfect example is the Northern Securities Trust was disbanded in 1904 through the use of legislation and Roosevelt's power. Um, this was basically a monopoly that controlled all the railroads of the Northwestern United States and in one big economic entity called the Northern Securities Trust. Um, the uh, legislation and the courts forced that, that monopoly of a whole bunch of different railroads to be split up into little parts, right? And there's m more of this um, that goes on in the progressive era between 1900 and, and 1920. Um, uh, we get new legislation in the Clayton Antitrust Act that is a way that allows the government to, to um, break up monopolies that are acting against the public interest. And, and so that begins in this time, probably not as aggressively as, as most progressives would want, right? Um, other things that were going on during this time, another book was The Jungle. Um, and this is a perfect example of the ties between muckraking journalism and legislation during the progressive era. This guy Upton Sinclair writes a book called The Jungle. In The Jungle, he's describing, a, he's describing um, the way that meatpacking houses in Chicago work, right? He was actually trying to write this book about the difficult lives that, that immigrant workers in Chicago meatpacking houses have. Like, it's a really dangerous job. People are always chopping off fingers and stuff like that. But um, uh, when people read it, all they could, all they could think about was how gross it was the way they were treating the meat. Um, in class, we'll read an excerpt, and it's, and it's gross, right? It's like, oh my God, I can't believe that our meat is treated that way before it gets to us. Um, Sinclair said, uh, I was aiming for America's heart, but I hit him in the stomach. And this was so disgusting to so many people and so concerning that soon they passed all kind of the, the Clean Food and Drug Act of 1906 is passed in part because of that book, right? So Muckraker writes book. It gets attention to a new problem that people hadn't really considered but had then been there for a long time. Clever legislation acts to solve the problem. Right? That's the way the progressive era was, was working. And in some ways, that's kind of the way that our whole system is supposed to work. Right? Anyway, uh, actually, I don't know if that's how our system is supposed to work. If you had asked Thomas Jefferson back in the day, like, hey, Tom, what do you think about the federal government regulating the meat industry? He'd be like, whoa, that's way too much intrusion from the federal government. Right? We don't need the federal government to do any of that. However, that's because Thomas Jefferson thought we should all have our own cow out in the backyard. We know how that thing was slaughtered because we were slaughtering it. Right? It's a new world that needs some changes to our um, hundred and at this point, you know, hundred twenty year old system. Right? So anyway. Um, Okay, we saw again in the which came first recently, we saw the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which brought more like international attention to worker sa safety, excuse me. So the, um, the uh, a big part of the progressive era is working towards safer conditions for workers, um, including getting children out of the workforce. And there's all sorts of legislation that's trying to enforce worker safety. Uh, worker compensation comes out of the progressive era. So the idea that if I get hurt on the job, like if I whap myself in the face with this stick um, while doing my job, then my boss should pay for my medical bills to, to get me patched back up, right? Um, the, uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, again, a whole bunch of media attention to this one horrible accident that exemplifies a larger problem in American society that get, then gets dealt with through legislation, right? Um, the, uh, also, I would, it, I would point out that through all of this, a lot of, these, uh, a lot of the journalists who are involved are women, right? This is an area where it's okay for women to take a role. 
right? So Ida Tarbell is out writing about the uh, Standard Oil, and she is pointing out all of these, uh, all the problem, the ways that Standard Oil uses its massive economic might to hurt American families and American workers, right? That gets into the moral realm that women have always been around, allowed to tread in, right? And journalism is a is a field that women have been allowed to be a part of, and so this is a way that women can engage themselves in the American experience when they're when they're left out of the political system a lot of the time, right? Um, okay, these last parts of my timeline weren't in the chapter, but they're in the progressive era, and I think they need to be here, so I'm gonna go through them real fast. Um, it's weird because I, like, um, this is my first time teaching with this book, and I'm not going through, like, it probably the, the 17th Amendment is in another um, chapter later, but I'm not sure. I think it should be in this chapter, so I'm just going to go with it real fast. We also see massive, um, uh, we see a, a four amendments that are called the Progressive Era Amendments that are important to understand. The 16th Amendment allows income tax. This is, uh, um, nobody likes taxes, but income taxes are a lot fairer way to tax Americans, but it was deemed unconstitutional after the Civil War. And so, um, and the 16th Amendment allows income tax. Um, this is important because the progressive movement asks for the government to be more active, and that costs money. So this is a more fair way to get that money into the system. We also haven't had a national bank in it since Andrew Jackson killed the bank in the early 1830s. And so the, um, they establish a new national bank that's really convoluted. That's part of the deal with the progressive era. They always got to kind of find a kind of tricky way to solve these problems. But the Federal Reserve System becomes what is now our national bank, right? And that allows us to have a more elastic currency that allows us to, to um, react better to economic crises. Although some of you are smart enough to identify the irony between the fact that I'm saying we can solve our economic problems now when this is 16 years before the crash of 1929 and the horrible Great Depression. But anyway, um, the 17th Amendment creates a uh, direct election of senators, meaning that the people get to vote on senators. As the Constitution was originally written, state legislatures chose those senators. That led to more and more backroom deals. And part of the progressive era um, is, at least for white folks and for women, it's the idea that we need more political participation, that, that average Americans need more say. So rather than having the, you know, the Oregon State Legislature go into some smoke-filled room to pick our senators, we, the citizens of Oregon, get to vote on them. This is more, this uh, empowers American voters a little bit more, right? Um, in the 18th Amendment, they prohibited alcohol. Um, this is the era of prohibition. The 18th Amendment will get turned over in 1933, but um, prohibition of alcohol is one of the, like, so if you think about, I think probably a lot of you are sitting at home saying, well, the progressive era sounds pretty cool. Like they're, they're solving America's problems. Sometimes um, those solutions might infringe on some personal liberties, right? So, and prohibition is generally seen as a failure. Like Americans didn't want to prohibit alcohol and so it didn't really work very well. Um, but you can see how that ties in. Like how can we solve a bunch of America's problems? We can do it through stopping alcohol use because alcohol is really harmful to a lot of families. It takes a financial toll, all these sorts of things. And so you can, that's part of that problem solving spirit even if you don't always hit it smack on. Um, and the most important of these amendments is the, the 19th Amendment that uh, grants women the right to vote in 1920. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go through some key concepts. Um, I mentioned that progressive isn't tied to a single political party, right? It is, the progressive movement was largely a middle class, urban, and white um, movement. And this is part of what separates it away from the populace, if you're still worried about what I was talking about before. It also is, there's a judgmental element to the progressive movement, right? It, um, uh, it really emphasizes experts and science, right? And sometimes those things can go a little bit awry. For example, during this time, Social Darwinism was basically seen as science, and 
progressives said, well, if the si we need to follow the science. God, how many times have you heard this phrase, follow the science during this pandemic? At the time, the science said that certain people were inferior just because of their, their race, right? And so this made it okay to continue Jim Crow laws. Um, there was a whole really gross movement toward um, eugenics, which was basically deciding who could breed with whom and, and which people should be sterilized and stuff, right? And so um, there's, a, there's a yucky element to, I put science in quotation marks here, because science changes sometimes, right? We learn new things. And uh, so this emphasis on experts in science got twisted up sometimes. Um, and uh, um, I talked about muckrakers. Part of this whole thing is tied to the social gospel movement, which is really fascinating to me. I'm always intrigued by the social gospel movement. Um, the social gospel movement um, is, is in, it like goes against the ideas of social Darwinism. And um, it began really with a book called What Would Jesus Do? Actually, I'm sorry. The book was called In His Steps, but this is kind of where the phrase, what would Jesus do, comes from. And a lot of what's going on in that is it's, it's a book that's trying to tell people, you know, on Sunday you go to church and you learn all this about the, about the Christian gospel, but then you go back to the factory that you own and you treat those workers like crap and you don't live your life in a way that is in accordance with the, with the Christian gospel, right? And so... Um, the idea is we need to tie some of our Christian values back into the way we behave economically um, and in the way we treat the least among us, right? I I any decent reading of the Bible, I think, really shows that, that Jesus is most worried about the, the meek and those, the disempowered in society and the, the refugee and folks like that, right? And so... The social gospel movement, you can see how that would motivate reformers to say, I want to go fix these problems, right? Um, so that's a, there's, a, there's an important religious component of this. I, it's also, remember, religion has always been one of the places where women have been allowed in society to express themselves. And so once this be, when this is a religious issue, then it allows for all that energy of American women who want to make a difference to come into this realm of our society, right? Um, this really ties in down here, and I thought the chapter was going to go into more detail, so I put this up there. The women's suffrage movement and the, the prohibition movement were very much linked together. We'll talk about that in the class. Um, during this time also, we see real important environmental legislation, like the progressive era is, is the kind of the beginnings of our of anything you might call environmentalism during this, this era. One of the real lucky things that happens to the United States with the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt is that he just happens to be uh, very much like concerned about the environment and natural places and things like that. So a lot of land gets uh, preserved, set aside, those sorts of things during the progressive era. There's debate about how best to um, uh, deal with these natural places, right? Um, this debate manifests itself in the differences between preservation and conservation. Um, and I think they cover this in, in some of the science classes. But um, so John Muir, who was a California preservationist, he thought that those wild places should be left alone to be wilderness right? We shouldn't put roads in there. We shouldn't use them. We should, we should leave them alone. Um, whereas other people, including Gifford Pinchot, and Roosevelt was really like this too, um, were conservationists who said we should uh, um, protect those places, but use them uh, um, as best we could, right? And so, uh, and this is the vision that wins out. So if you think about the Mount Hood National Forest, there's all kinds of access to the Na uh, Mount Hood National Forest. We log parts of the Mount Hood National Forest. Um, there's skiing and recreation up there and, and mountain biking and, and that sort of stuff and hunting. People are allowed in there. There are roads in, but it's still somewhat wild. So it's like, People need to use this, but we also need to save its essence.
right? And that's the, that's the big environmental debate during this time. The conservationists really um, went out. Um, again, the head of, or the main voice in that conservationism, well, the main voice is Roosevelt, but then the, the guy that does most of it is Gifford Pinchot. And the name Gifford Pinchot might ring a bell because the national forests on Mount Adams are the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. So you might hear that name. Yeah. Um, and here we go. We talked about that. Okay, yeah. In my old textbook, it said, for whites only? It was one of the headings, and kids would always ask about it. Basically, the progressive era, it says here, it allowed continuation of Jim Crow. And um, it's worse than that. Like, the progressive era kind of put a stamp of, of, um, of approval on Jim Crow from the white middle class expert authorities, right? Um, there, the and Jim Crow is the horrible system in the South that that maintained black folks as second class citizens. During the Progressive Era, we see more and more legislation that limits the rights of black people. Um, there's irony here because if you describe the Progressive Era as a time when um, some Americans are going after our worst problems and really trying to solve some problems to make life better for people. America's worst problem at the time was the, the horrors of Jim Crow and the treatment of African Americans in the South. Um, yet the Progressive Era allowed this to continue. Um, it allowed Southern states to write more and more laws that restricted the rights of African Americans. A lot of those, the ickiest portions of the progressive era, the eugenics, the sterilization, had racial components to it. Um, this is all going on at a time when we are supposedly going around the world, like we're, we're creating an empire during this time too. And all of a sudden we have non-white people under our control in the Philippines and in Hawaii and places like that. And um, it's seen as, as our res white people's responsibility to tell these non-white people what to do because they can't handle it themselves. And that goes for the American South too. Um, uh, it's really a, a yucky side to the progressive era. Um, two of America's great African-American voices come out of this, though, and they're uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois is the, one of the founders of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, which is r our longest standing uh, black rights organization, right? And um, he is like, no, we need to end all forms of segregation right now. Um, he's the first black person to get a doctorate from Harvard. Like, he's this brilliant dude, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Booker T. Washington. And so um, Du Bois says, we need to end all this segregation stuff now. Booker T. Washington says, you know, black folks should put up with segregation in exchange for um, uh, the building of black colleges and especially black like trade schools and stuff like that that would allow black people, people to develop economic independence and thereby earn the respect of white people and that this is a better way forward for, for black folks is to get those real world skills. We don't need PhDs from Harvard. We need to be trained as electricians and, and plumbers and get good decent jobs and then have our white neighbors see the value of our skills and incorporate us into society in that way, right? Um, some people, like Booker T. Washington, is sometimes described as, as uh, you know, giving in to segregation. And, and advocates of W.E.B. Du Bois' side on this would say, you know, um, we need to prove our worth. Like, we built this country uh, as slaves. And so we don't need to put in any more time, like, earning the, the trust of our white compatriots. They need to earn our trust, right? But... Um, you can look at this, the simple way to look at this that might be the best way is that Du Bois was more about um, political rights and philosophy and Booker T. Washington was more practical and it was more about economic, um, uh, economic factors, ec economic equality or uh, economic equity. Yeah, um, it's an interesting thing. We'll talk about it in class too. Thank you for paying attention. It's nice to see you.